Hello everybody, you're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. This is the weekly radio show where we have a different guest each week. We play local, unsigned and indie music. We head over to the Rye Light Zone for a short story and or some poetry. And we catch up with Twangling Jack Ford for a weekly album review. As always, you can email me here at the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. I would love to hear from you if you think you'd be a good guest or if you just have some mp3s and stuff you would like to share with us you can also find us on facebook if you search for the art show on wickham sound we repeated here on wickham sound on monday nights we're on the wickham sound listen again you can also find us on itunes spotify and wherever you get your podcasts so this week we're going to be doing a little bit of a highlight show um but before we get into that we are going to head over to the rye light zone with say kevy uh with a reading of one of her susie snowflake stories so over to kevy has anyone heard of susie snowflake I've met a fair share of cantankerous Scrooges, but I've never met someone with the same aversion to Christmas as I have. Every year at this time I get sick. My pulse races, I sweat profusely, and a panic grows within me until the holiday passes. Christmas is cursed, and nobody else seems to realize it. Nobody else shares in my fear of this season, my fear of the tapping. Nobody else knows about Susie Snowflake. Growing up, I lived in a garden apartment, one that's below street level. Because of this, we didn't have very many windows, just one high up in the living room. Not much of a view, obviously. But every year around Christmas time, my mother would hang bright little Christmas lights around it. Back then, I loved Christmas. My mom and I didn't have much, but she always made Christmas feel special. We'd have those lights on the window and a modest tree in the corner, decorated with tinsel and popcorn and a beautiful porcelain angel on top. It was humble and cozy and filled me with the Christmas spirit. Christmas didn't come without issues though. Mommy, I once cried, a blubbering puddle in the middle of the floor. What about Santa Claus? How is he going to bring me presents if we don't have a chimney? Ah, oh, hush, sugar plum. You don't gotta worry about Santa Claus. Sure, we don't have a chimney, but he's got other ways of bringing you presents. You see that window? It's far too small for Santa to fit through, but that's why he has his little elves. When Santa gets here to our home, he has his tiny assistants climb through the window and place all your presents lovingly around the tree. Elves? What are their names? Why, they're, um, Hard Rock and Coco and Joe. Can I meet them, Mommy? No, Sugar Plum. Santa's elves will only deliver your presents when they're absolutely sure you're asleep. That conversation succeeded in stopping my tears, but it filled me with determination. This Christmas, I must see those elves. The night before Christmas, Mom put me to bed. I laid awake waiting for elves overhead. My mom sipped her tea, went off to bed and slept. It was time to discover. To the living room, I crept. In the days leading up to Christmas Eve, I formulated a plan. I would wait till mom was finished with her tea and went to sleep. Then I'd hide in the living room till the elves appeared. I knew most kids leave milk and cookies for Santa, but I wasn't sure what the elves would like. So I poured them some apple juice and a Mountain Dew. I carried the glasses to the living room, spilling a little as I went, and sat beside the tree out of view from the window. I didn't know how long I'd have to wait. So I started sipping the pop to pass the time. Pretty soon both glasses were empty and my bladder was full. Oh, I needed to pee so bad, but I was afraid I'd miss them if I went to the bathroom. When I couldn't hold it any longer, I finally dashed to the toilet. Oh, what a sweet relief. I sat there breathing heavily, out of breath from how intensely I was going. As the final few drops reached the bowl, I heard a soft sound in the other room. Tap. 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 It was them. I was so excited to follow the distant noise. 
I didn't wash my hands or even flush the toilet. I just ran to the living room, ready to meet my new friends. Everything was exactly where I left it. Even the empty glasses on the carpet. There were no elves in sight. I stood there in silence, wondering if I'd even heard anything or just wished it, when I heard it again. Tap. 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 I looked up at the window, too high for me to see out of. Is that you, Mr. Elf? Mr. Joe? Coco? A quiet voice responded, Please come out and play with me. I haven't long to stay. Do you have my presents? I'll help you make a snowman. Are you one of Santa's elves? No, Sugar Plum. I'm Susie Snowflake. Please come out and play with me. What are you doing out there? You're gonna scare Santa. I just want to play. Won't you come out and play with me? No, I'm waiting for the elves to deliver my presents. Suddenly, the gentle, melodious voice became jagged and aggressive, while still quite quiet. You're not going to get any presents if you don't come out and play with me. Obviously, I didn't want to miss out on my presents, so I climbed up to the back of the couch to open the window. A frigid gust of wind burst through the opening and nearly knocked me over. After I regained my balance, I peered out the window and I saw her. The beautiful Christmas demon. Porcelain skin, crystal eyes, delicate razor sharp ice shards adorning her arms and head. Once again, the haunting figure whispered to me, won't you come out and play with me? I haven't long to stay. There was absolutely no way I would go with that crystalline creature. I shut the window, hopped off the couch, and started back toward my bedroom. But then I heard it. Tap. 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 I froze in my tracks. After a minute, it came again. Tap. 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 The tapping became louder and more frequent. Wind was howling and throwing snow against the window. Finally, with a piercing scream, she tapped so hard it broke the window. Snow quickly flooded our apartment. Icy wind chilled me to the bone. It wasn't until my mom wrapped her arms around me that I realized I was screaming. My mother never believed my story. To this day, she blames me for breaking the window. She was so mad at me for something I didn't do and for lying to her on top of it. As punishment, we didn't celebrate Christmas in any capacity. Mom couldn't afford to have the window replaced, so she sealed it with wrapping paper until she could return all the gifts she had bought for me. She made sure I was disillusioned with Christmas that year. There was no Santa. There were no elves. Most importantly, there was no Susie Snowflake. But there was Susie Snowflake. She came to me that night. I saw her, and I faced the consequences of crossing her. Susie was right. I didn't go out and play with her, so I didn't get any presents. I can't imagine I'm the only person who's been harassed by this icy demon. Please, if you've ever encountered Susie Snowflake, share your story. I need to know I'm not alone. Big thank you to Kevy for this week's uh, story. As always, you can find her on YouTube if you search for Say Kevy, as in French, so C apostrophe E S T and then Kevy spelled K-E-V-V-I-E. -E. Definitely do check out her channel. She's also a big Agatha Christie fan. And she just makes some really great content on top of um, the stories that she writes as well. So we're going to have a little bit of music. Um, and this is a new tune by myself called Rabbit in Tamworth. Let's check it out. So it's all about the you-know-what With the you-know-who and the you-know-why 
I try so hard but I can't stop thinking about you So every time I close my eyes I'm either going crazy or I'm going blind There's gotta be some way to say Things just ain't that easy My heart beats racing and I'm scared to death Spent half my life trying to save my breath And it's only something stupid that I thought of when I wasn't thinking It's easy to see it and believe you me I promise that I'm honest and I guarantee that thing you see bleeding on my sleeve is just my heart It lies to me Believe me It lies to me Believe me I try to speak but it ain't easy I'm tired of keeping quiet But I lost my voice Now I'm calling out your name The foxes and the wolves have gone insane now I'm sitting on the kitchen floor alone The house where I grew up is not my home Wish I was stoned Wish I could get stoned Wish I was stoned Wish I could get a stone It lies to me Believe It lies to me Believe me I try to speak But it ain't easy I'm tired of keeping quiet But I lost my voice Now I'm calling out your name The foxes and the wolves have gone insane Now I'm sitting on the kitchen floor alone The house where I grew up is not my home Wish I was stoned Wish I could get stoned Wish I was stoned Wish I could get stoned Wish I was stoned Wish I could get stoned Wish I was stoned Wish I was
a city man standing in the dew. Welcome to my company, a penny for you too. I stuck a lolly up my nose and almost pierced the brain. Come back, Paddy Carstairs, and come back from Colain. Venture, I think it is venture, venture, man. Here I am, a silly man standing in the gloom. Welcome to my company, a penny for you too. I stuck a lolly up my nose and almost pierced the brain. Come back, Paddy Carstairs, come back, Bronco. Shirt and here it comes again. Oh, look, and here comes Red Perry plus Tap Hunter, and that makes three. Oh, blah, blah. All right, that was Clapton's shirt by Occasionally David, and before that, we had Rabbit in Tamworth by myself, Dan Cobain. You're listening to the Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. And uh, normally this is where we would go over to our guests, but we're doing a highlight show. So uh, we'll go straight over to a highlight of our second chat with J.B. Hilliard, a fancy novelist. Um, obviously, only book one is out so far. And I, I am uh, privileged enough to have read the manuscript for book two as well. So I'm sort of privy to a little bit more information than most. But obviously, you as the creator, you, you know the whole story as well. And there have even been, I'm sure there were times when we were working on the book. When I left a comment somewhere saying, I'd leave a comment saying like, I hope this comes back into it later. Or you've mentioned this, like, you need to make a bigger deal of this. And you're kind of there like, don't worry, I've already, <laughs> it's, it's very <laughs> deliberate, you know. So um, <laughs> it's, it's kind of like, um, there's the, the old writing rule, which is like, if, if someone's going to fire a gun at, at the end of the third act, you need to mention it in the first act. But yours, like, you, were, I was reading it the other way around. So it's like, you've mentioned this here. And this is a really big thing. So you need to make sure this gets mentioned again and actually properly addressed. And it's like, yeah, don't worry, we're getting there. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And I, I think I've, I've done that, a, you know, a few times. And when I've had, you know, beta readers take a look at the book too and, and you, know, uh, you know, other copy editors, that's, I always get that in, this, uh, in the edits. And then yeah. later on in the book, they're like, oh, I see you addressed it, yeah. right? But it's like, you know, and I think that's, that's fun, but that's that pacing I had to learn and I still need to be coached on that from time to time. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's something that you just sort of keep on learning over time, I suppose. And I mean, the more books you work on, the more rounds of edits you go through, the more, you know, the more you're going to pick up and be able to apply to the next book. So, I mean, I suppose the hope would be, I mean, especially after the first book, I mean, it took us, what, like 18 months or something to get it just <laughs> perfect for release. So the hope is the next one will not take 18 months, you know? Yeah, well, yeah. And, and as you know, it didn't. It took three, and then yeah. you started editing. Right? I was writing part of that when I was writing the first one. You know, yeah, stuff was yeah. already done, and I've got half of book three done already. It becomes yeah. a muscle memory. It's a habit. And uh, and you want to tell the story. So there's a, there's a passion and an energy that if you're the right kind of author, I think, that comes out. I'm not, I'm not writing, you know, for the sake of writing. I'm writing something that I'm passionate about because I really like the story all right that was a highlight of our chat with jv hilliard and this is when we chatted to local blues man thomas heppel of the thomas heppel band so and you mentioned your music which is obviously the main thing i want to talk to you about so uh what can you tell us about the thomas heppel uh, blues band but like how did you guys form and what are some of the, the, the shows you guys have played <laughs> okay so so ba well we're now called the thomas heppel band because um okay. although Normally we do blues. Um, it's only just been changed to that because we basically had a chat last night at rehearsal about mm -hmm. where we might want to take the band. And although blues is like our main thing, we don't want to just be restricted to a blues band. Yeah. Um, but I met the lads, so my drummer Aiden and bassist Ryan, and guitarist Tom at the Bellevue Pub in High Wycombe, and. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's quite funny. So they do the Sunday Jam there at the beginning of the month. And if anyone's a musician that might be watching this, listening to this, uh, and live in the Wickham area, go to it. It's amazing. Um, <laughs> went up there, did my thing with the first set with a few people, jammed out some blues. And um, the guys that, the, the house band was my band now. They were running the jam that day and they heard me do my, came over and said, oh, that, that was quite nice what you did there. And I was like, oh, thank you, kind of thing. Anyways, left it at that. And then um, I heard they were quite popular and wicked and they're called the Running Guns. And um, <laughs> they got me to go on with them at the end. And we just jammed some blues and some heavy rock and <laughs> it just went really well. And then Aiden and Tom were like, we should do something together. And then, yeah, a few, like a week or so later, Tom got in touch, my guitarist, and said, let's go for a rehearsal, see what, see what happens. Did a rehearsal with them, got some songs down straight away. Um, and then, yeah, so the rest is pr pretty much history currently. So we've got loads of gigs coming in now. So we've got a gig this Saturday, funny enough, at the Bellevue. Um, but the band lineup has changed relatively recently because... Our guitarist Tom is moving to France, okay. um, so he's just taking a step back for the time being, just to sort himself out. So it's just the three of us at the moment. Um, I wouldn't say he's left the band because there'll always be a spot for him there because he's such a brilliant guitarist. But uh, we're just going to sort of make do as a trio at the moment, just see how it goes, work on a few things, some original stuff. Um, see so yeah, how we've got a gig this Saturday, got a gig at the end of the month as well, and a couple more gigs in February. So it's, it's picking up really nicely. So, yeah, that's the story of the Thomas Heppel band. <laughs> cool. cool. And, um, I mean, I suppose with, with uh, the guitarist moving to France as well, I mean, you can play lead guitar yourself. And one of the questions I wanted to ask you is, actually, you, you can play a lot of different instruments. And you do your YouTube videos uh, where you play all of the different instruments yes. yourself. Um, what are some of the challenges mm -hmm. in doing that? I mean, I can imagine, like, editing it together is a challenge. You know, I mean, like, how do you start? Do you start just with a click track? So basically, it depends really. So, what I find the hardest uh, recording it all is what instrument do you start off with and trying to keep time because you're literally, you have to record each track individually. So, you are going to have one instrument completely on its own. So, it's really either for me going to be guitar or drums yeah. and play them to dead in time. <laughs> to nothing else it's really really hard so you try and play it with a metronome but it's like always like retake retake yeah. <laughs> retake all the time all right that was a highlight of our chat with uh, thomas heppel and this is a weird one we're going to a highlight when i chatted to myself uh, and i was my own guest i got people on youtube to throw out some questions and had a go at answering them so over to me so too tight latrec has asked do you have creative doldrums? And if so, how do you kick yourself out of it slash them? Or do you just relax and rest up until you're ready to work again? Um, I'm a workaholic, so I never really rest. Um, the closest I come to resting is working, but at least I'll be sitting down. Um, I guess I do have creative doldrums. I'm kind of in the middle of one now. I've started writing this book um, that's going to be set in my hometown of Tamworth. Kind, of, It's kind of a coming of age novel set when and where I came of age, you know? Um, and it's just a hard one to write. Um, so to be honest, I've just been putting off writing that. Um, but normally I'm working on so many projects that if I have creative doldrums about one project, I just move on and work on something else, you know, and then come back to it later and, it, and it's fine. Uh, Ms. Reads a lot says, what unread book has been on your shelf the longest? Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna check my Goodreads for this. Okay, so it's uh, Christopher Vogler's The Writer's Journey, Mythic Structure for Writers, which I will be getting to soon. It's just a non-fiction book about the art of writing. That's kind of why I've been putting it off, you know? Although I think Goodreads, it sorts not, not necessarily by the time I put them on my shelves, but by the date I added them to my want to read list. Because uh, the next one up is Across the River and Into the Trees by Ernest Hemingway. And I picked that up like two weeks ago at a charity shop. But it says here, the date added for the writer's journey, June the 23rd, 2013. So I should get to that soon, really. And Ms. Reads a lot also asked, what's your favorite book of all time? That is uh, Northern Lights by Philip Pullman. I actually have a tattoo of Yorick Bernison, the armored bear. And uh, yeah, it's just the book that made me fall in love with reading. I actually gave it to my friend Sabrina recently because uh, she hasn't read it. And you know, she should read it. Uh, Al from Big Hard Books and Classics, he has another question. Robert McCallman should get talked more about on Booktube. Do you agree? No, I mean, 
I've never read him, so I, I can't say I care. Um, maybe, I, I don't know. I'm sure people out there are talking about it, and that's the good thing about BookTube. So for those of you who are listening to this on the radio as opposed to watching on YouTube, BookTube is like a YouTube community of people who make videos talking about books. They share what they're currently reading, reviews, book hauls, all that sort of thing. Um, but the good thing about BookTube is that you can find people talking about pretty much whatever authors you're interested in, you know? All right, that was uh, part of the uh, show that I was my own guest for. <laughs> and uh, this is a highlight of our chat with local photographer Vicky Baptiste of Flux Photographic. Yeah, cool. And um, another thing I, I noticed you, you do sometimes is uh, you occasionally kind of give away free uh, photo shoots. And you actually, I think you ask people to sort of nominate somebody who, mm -hmm. who you know, who deserves it, whether it's, you know, maybe a new mum who's, you know, who needs to feel good about themselves or whether it's, well, you know, whatever, whatever the case might be. And um, I wonder just, uh, you know, who are some of those those people that you photograph like that who are sort of particularly deserving? Oh, there's so many. Um, so I usually do that around my birthday. Um, yeah. Just because I think it's really, really important to give back. And I feel like I've got a skill that not everybody is able to access and everybody should be able to access it. So one of my customers, um, a couple of years ago, actually, they had, um, so their mum was fighting a battle with cancer mm -hmm. and she was nominated, quite a few people nominated this person. Um, and her mum was fighting a battle with cancer and they wanted to do a shoot and they weren't sure whether to ask me or not. And I was like, just tell me in an ideal world, what are we doing? Um, and they wanted to do this shoot down in Mudderford, which I'd never heard of before. I've never been there. Um, and it's right down on the coast. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, they wanted to do a shoot there. It's a couple of hours drive, but it was where they'd gone for their family holidays growing up. They had so many memories there and they wanted to go and do the shoot down there. And they were like, well, I don't really know whether we can ask for that. And we, yep, that's where we'll go and do the shoot. So we went down and we sort of recreated some of their childhood poses that they'd done. And we took some photos with the children and their mum. Um, it was one of the most memorable ones of those shoots that I've done, to be honest with you. Um, the most amazing, beautiful family. And just to help that family create those memories um, and just bring a day of happiness and, you know, happy memories for them or to help in that tiny little bit that I could. Yeah. Um, that was really special for me. And I think people always see it as I'm doing something for them. It's not always that. That really does something for me. Um, yeah. I love hearing people's stories. I love spending that time with them. And I love doing my little bit, the tiny bit that I can do, um, you know, just, just to help them capture those memories. Because that's what we do as photographers. We don't just take pictures and chuck them on a hard drive. Uh, we create people's memories. We create the things that they're going to look back on and show their children and their grandchildren. And, and that's what's left. So, so yeah, that's, that's particularly um, a really fond memory of one of those shoots for me. Cool. That was a highlight of our chat with Vicky Baptiste from Flux Photographic. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and this is Jessica Williamson with Turning Point.
That was Turning Point by Jessica Williamson. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. This week, we have a highlight show, so we're catching up with some of the highlights of our previous guests. And um, this is part of our chat with John Buttigieg. So over to John. What can you tell us about your time in Malta? Who did you take lessons with? And do you take any influence from Maltese music into your own work? Okay. um, I spent time in Malta on and off throughout my 20s. Uh, it was one of mixed experiences, I'd say. Um, some of them were quite positive. Regardless, I had the pleasure of being taught by an excellent pianist, uh, Julian Dyson, who was residing in Malta at the time, luckily. So, really wonderful chap and an excellent musician. He helped me to understand the true nature of piano, I'd say, and its nuanced sounds and resonance. We also had good fun exploring some of exploring some of my compositional work. At the time, this was a suite for piano made up of four pieces entitled Uncharted. I also worked with Rosetta Di Battista, a true musician in every sense of the word, as well as a trained music therapist. So, so far I've not been explicitly aware of any particular Maltese influence in my work, but who knows what the subconscious can bring out artistically? To be honest, Dane, this question really, really got me thinking, and I'll endeavour to explore any Maltese cultural influence within my Maltese identity now. By the way, uh, there's a great Maltese composer, Charles Camilleri, whose work is really good, and I feel eager to explore more of his pieces after thinking about this question. So you've completed degrees in philosophy and psychology as well as music therapy. Do those degrees have any influence on your music? Okay, yes. Um, The answer is yes, of course, because ultimately all experiences have some impact upon an artist, I believe. So, say, the depth of thought within the disciplines of philosophy and psychology certainly opened up my mind to new ideas which translated into music. I will say, Dane, though, that it's more of a holistic processing which manifests musically rather than a particular piece of writing or literature that gives me inspiration. My MA in music therapy had the most tangible influence upon my art, I think. Specifically, it gave me an even greater appreciation of spontaneous music making, which is where I feel that I'm in my element. Within the course, there was also an intriguing discourse about the links between music and psychotherapy, as well as its influence upon the brain. The course really enabled me to view music as a phenomenon which affects us as human beings in so many more ways than I could previously have envisaged. All right, that was part of our chat with composer John Buttigieg, and uh, this is part of our little catch-up with Kay McLeod, who is a fantasy novelist. What was the last book that you read, and what did you think of it? Oh, okay, so the last book I read was, I've started the Dave Abad trilogy. Can't remember the author off the top of my head now, I feel really bad about it. But yeah, it's kind of like um, Middle Eastern fantasy, there's like, Gene involved lots of magical powers like basically I love anything fantasy really and uh, yeah I'll definitely be continuing that trilogy on because I find it really interesting yeah just with the different cultural aspects as well it's not just like your typical like medieval fantasy like you see a lot of so yeah really enjoying that yeah well it's just funny I was chatting to another author who who also writes fantasy and we were kind of talking about the similar thing how historically fantasy has been like very just western like uh, western civilization inspired and um you know there's a lot more a lot, a lot of different voices kind of coming out now yeah it's brilliant just to see the different mix of authors coming out and it's amazing that people can kind of feel that they can do something new and fresh and different as well because there's been so much of kind of the same thing over and over again which like people's fresh take on it is brilliant but it's, it's just nice to see something different yeah well also i suppose again with like the sort of traditional like western uh, western civilization inspired fantasy in a way it does also feel a bit as though it's like already been done as well you know so again having those different influences it can just make something like nice and fresh and exciting 
Yeah, and you feel like you're really learning something as well because it's not just the different types of magic, but you kind of introduce like the different food of the culture, like the clothing, uh, even like the way they build stuff, the structures and things. So it's like you feel like you're really immersed in it. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah, so I mean, with fantasy, because obviously most people would think of fantasy as being like particularly like in the realms of imagination and made up and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. Um, but again, like it kind of holds up, a, I guess, like holds up a mirror to, to, to us as well. I mean, especially when you think of like the characters, obviously, if it's a good fantasy novel, they're going to be very human characters and like very relatable, even though it's such a different world to the one we know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like character is such an important thing, like especially in fantasy, because the way that people approach things, like there's these crazy things going on, but if you've got somebody who's down to earth and relatable, they're kind of your gateway into it. That was part of our chat with fantasy novelist Kay McLeod, and here is a highlight of our chat with uh, Andrew Hoger, Andrew Hogger, sorry, of Hoger's Wolf. Cool. So obviously one of the main things I want to talk to you about today is your music, and I thought a good place um, to begin with would be to ask um, how long you've been making music and where you got your start. Okay, I've, I've kind of had two stabs at it. I started when I was about 12 or 13 uh, um, playing the guitar. I uh, quite early on got involved in a band which I was with for about five years um, and we were starting to do things, get gigs. We did um, a Battle of the Bands back then and we won our regional uh, and we're going, I can't remember whether it was uh, a Southern or, or the actual final thing or whatever it was, but the, the lead guitarist at the time decided that uh, it was too early in the morning to get up uh and so we didn't go um which didn't sit well with me at all and uh, i don't think it was too long after that that i left the band i was starting to get more interested in folk music then the band being if you like a new wave british heavy metal type of affair um and i was very much into the early mark bolan tyrannosaurus rex uh, set up that he had uh, and so I went solo for a couple of years but uh, back in the heydays of the Spandau Ballets and the George Michaels um, there, there really wasn't an audience for for that kind of thing so I gave up uh, and about six seven years ago I was spending evenings a lot of the time on my own because my wife was practicing reflexology um, and I thought I can't sit here in front of the telly uh, and do nothing. So I I had a guitar. I thought, well, I'll just learn a couple of songs, just see how that goes. And I got the bug again, and I really threw myself into it. Oh. And that's it. <laughs> that was a highlight of our chat with Hoger's Wolf. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and this is Dreamlight State by Joe Martin. I'm here, I'm here. like a light in the sand. Maybe I should be writing something To mean something to somebody To me But the words are like drip, drip And somehow they don't want to fit, fit There's a shift and it changes I'm into different stages Sky 
was already broken by Without My Addiction. Before that, we had Dreamlike State by Joe Martin. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. And it's time for us to head over to the Elk Shed for this week's album review from Twangling Jack Ford. Toots and the Maytals, reggae greats. There was a lot of reggae about in the late 60s and early 70s, but it was mostly released out of Wilsdon in West London by Trojan Records, and it was hard to see the talent from the exploited. A real act from Jamaica, or someone shouting over a pre-used backing track. After Desmond Decker's big hit with the Israelites, reggae became another kind of chart pop music. Some was inspirational, like Bob and Marcia's Young, Gifted and Black, and some was so catchy many did not even recognise it as reggae, like Nicky Thomas's Love of the Common People. And some surprised everybody with their success, like David Ansel Collins' Double Barrel. And every football terrace would stomp to the Harry J All-Stars liquidator. Mostly it was reggified covers that made the charts though. As a rule it had a reputation for being skinhead music, and so was loathed by hippies and serious rock fans. People like me, but I really liked it. As the 70s went on, it became clear that there were some genuine performing artists like Bob Marley and the Wailers, Jimmy Cliff and Toots and the Maytals. Toots had had a number of his songs picked up by Trojan Records and some of his songs like 5446 Was My Number had become known from their appearance on the Tighten Up series of budget compilation albums. It was sad that a song titled after his prisoner number with a brilliant bass line should sit next to songs with titles like He's Got Barbed Wire in His Underpants. That made him a bit less credible than Marley and Cliff, who were promoted by Island Records, a well-known rock label. Then The Clash did Toots' Pressure Drop, and Two-Tone made the 60s skinhead music cool, and Monkey Man became a classic still played by covers bands today. And Toots is now rightly considered one of the reggae greats. Toots and the Maytals, reggae greats. Big thank you to Twangly Jack Ford for this week's album review. Thank you to all of the guests whose highlighty bits I shared. Thank you to Kevy for sharing her reading of uh, Susie Snowflake as well. As always, you've been listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. You can email me here at the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. I particularly want to hear from poets, musicians, performers, people with MP3s, people with local arts news, and people who would like to be on the show. You can also find us on Facebook if you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound. And we're repeated on Wickham Sound on Monday nights. And uh, we're on the Wickham Sound Listen Again. And also iTunes, Spotify, and wherever you get your podcasts. So, with that said, I'm going to love you and leave you. This is one last tune. This is Peter Crutchfield with I Wish You Told Me More. I will see you next week. Started work as a bank clerk when the clouds of war appeared. You went to fight, for that was right. You volunteered, you can't have feared what was to come. I'll never know what you saw. You see, I never went to war I've got your medals in my drawer I just wish you'd told me more Put on a ship to distant lands You fought in fields and on desert sands First on the beach at Anzio You had no choice You had to go You couldn't say no I'll never know what you saw You see I never went to war I've got your medals in my drawer I just wish you'd told me more 
What's it like to fire a gun? To be shot at or to shoot someone? To hear friends cries, to see friends die? To wonder when you'll be home again? I'll never know what you saw You see I never went to war I've got your medals in my drawer I just wish you'd told me more You got demobbed, I went back to your job Working in a bank No more mortar shells And no more cordite smells Just checks to exchange Paper to rearrange Such a change I'll never know what you saw You see I never went to war I've got your medals in my drawer I just wish you'd told me more The respects you paid on Remembrance Day To the ones you left behind Time to reflect, thoughts to recollect you showed your pride But kept so much deep inside I'll never know what you saw You see I never went to war I've got your medals in my drawer 